Good afternoon, everyone. This is another quick mini lecture contextualizing Kevin Nish's uh, The Blazing World. Uh, this should be another short uh, few minutes just to give you a little bit of background about Margaret Cavendish and to uh, and this particular text that should help you in reading this, this piece. Um, so Cavendish herself uh, was born into a wealthy family in Essex, England in 1623. She was the youngest of eight children. Her father died early. Um, and her, her, sing, her widowed mother gave her this model of uh, feminine independence. Um, eventually, she went on to marry, um, uh, sorry, she meant to marry Will, William Cavendish, who was, a, uh, who was a noble person, the Duke of Newcastle, making her uh, the Duchess of Newcastle. Uh, she eventually, she, in this uh, additional like, uh, wealth um, that she gained, allowed her to write under her own name uh, and self-finance the publication of her work, which was a novel thing, especially for a woman at the time. Uh, um, and many of her works were secular and experimental. Um, commentators write that she shows a fluidity with genre um, and, 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 and including also a fluidity with gender at various times that was fairly radical at the time, let alone the fact that a woman was publishing her own work under her own name. Um, and like the hybrid people of the blazing world, uh, many of her literary and philosophical works, they focus on themes of categorization and the limits of categorization. Uh, many of her works also include, just like in the blazing world, an epistle uh, or a preface to the reader that not only explain her intent, but defend her right to, her right, uh, to write and publish. Uh, they also provide a kind of theory of fiction uh, and interpretation and a guide to how to interpret the work. So make sure you read closely the dedicatory epistle, the letter to the reader at the beginning of the text. Um, so we have, so with Cavendish, we have this kind of ambivalent position. Uh, on the one hand, she's an outsider to the world of letters of, seven, of the early 17th century um, as a woman. But on the other hand, she comes from considerable privilege. Um, so she, can no, she could never really be accepted fully into the world of arts and letters. Uh, but she used this position as an outsider and triangulated this to kind of propel her writings. Um, and you can see this in the text of not necessarily the work that we read today, but some of her other more roman romance works, uh, where the characters, especially the women, triangulate se sexual desire using their own status as objects of sexual desire uh, to achieve their own goals. But if we're thinking about the political context, we can't talk about Cavendish without talking about the English Civil War. And I'm not going to, in this short video, give you an entire history of the English Civil War. But this was the war between uh, the armies of Parliament and King Charles I of the Stuart, uh, Stuart dynasty in England during the early to mid uh, 17th century, uh, in which the Engl it was a war over finances. It was a war over religious, uh, different religion. Uh, many feared, many in Parliament feared that Charles was trying to uh, bring Catholicism back to England. Uh, it was a war about the proper powers and scope of Parliament. Uh, and it was actually a series of wars and revolutions that ended with the short-lived uh, Republic uh, after the, over the, the defeat of Charles I's armies and his execution. Um, and then the establishment of the protectorate of Oliver Cromwell before the Stuart dynasty was restored when Parliament basically invited uh, Charles II back to take up the throne uh, later in the 17th century. Um, and, and Cavendish's husband, uh, William Cavendish, Duke of Newcastle, was one of the leaders of, the, of Charles I's armies during the Civil War. Uh, so he was, so that her fate was tied to the fortunes of the royalists rather than the republicans. And that becomes, should be very clear, uh, her own, throughout the text from The Blazing World, her own kind of preferred version of political authority. Uh, she actually ended up living in exile in Antwerp, uh, her, she and her husband, after the execution of Charles I, and they didn't return until the restoration of the monarchy allowed them to return much later. Uh, so the English Civil War is definitely looming over the Blazing, the text of the Blazing World, which was published itself in 1666 as an appendix to um, the her, her a more philosophical treatise, Observations on Experimental Philosophy. Um, in the latter text, this Observations upon Experimental Philosophy includes the claim that quote art produces hermaphroditical effects, that is, such as are partly natural and partly artificial. And so you get this kind of mix in the text of this mix of nature and artifice, both in its it's kind of you have this scientific work and this, and this fantasy work, um, but also in the content of the Blazing World itself. 
Uh, the observations itself uh, includes a kind of debate over the systems of uh, um, debates over um, the system of knowledge at the time, uh, including a response to Robert Hooke's uh, scientific experiments. Uh, and, and, and Cavendish argues that philosophical debates uh, and engages in philosophical debates, such as including those of like Hobbes's conception of matter. Um, and in the uh, Blazing World itself, there's a multiplicity of genres. Some scholars have called it the first science fiction book. Others call it a utopia. Uh, others say it's not a utopia because it doesn't actually provide a blueprint. Others say it's just purely a work of fantasy that we shouldn't take seriously politically. Others argue that we it gives us a different way of thinking about the utopian imagination. Um, and so Kate, I really want you when you're reading The Blazing World to really focus on how this is, how Cavendish really plays with the idea of utopia. Uh, and, and it's very different book than either Plato's Republic or uh, Moore's Utopia. And, and so kind of note the ways in which she, the idea of utopia itself is kind of, kind of fundamentally re reimagined and rearranged in this, in this text. Uh, as always, uh, we'll discuss this. On, I will discuss this next class. And if you have any questions, shoot me an email. Stop by in office hours. I look forward to discussing Cavendish's Blazing World with you all. Take care.